Good morning, this last Sunday of May 2020. I'm going to just give you a couple of announcements. One, you will hear me praying for a couple of people during the prayer time uh, named Steve and Daryl. Steve is not a part of our congregation. He lives out of state. He is an old friend of mine, and I just found out this week that he has um, stage four cancer, and he's having some surgery on Monday. So I told him that we would pray for him. And Daryl is a member of our congregation, and he has given me permission to share with you that he has esophageal cancer and will be facing some major surgery in the coming weeks, and he'll appreciate your prayers. So you will hear me pray for each of them. Also, uh, if you're watching this at 10.30 on Sunday morning, May 31, know that there, this service will be repeated live outside of our facility in the yard at 1 p.m. today. So uh, if you would come on Sunday, May 31st at 1 p.m., bring your own lawn chairs. And if you are still not comfortable being around people, that is okay. Uh, you can remain in your car, and the service will be broadcast on 90.1. But at least you'll be able to see uh, some of your brothers and sisters here in our congregation. And uh, when you do come, uh, please maintain social distancing. We're not going to do any handshakes or hugs or anything like that. So please be aware of that. And then next Sunday, which will be June 7, we are going to resume worship here inside the sanctuary. So the service on the 31st, that when you'll be watching this, that will include music outside. When we move inside for June 7, there will be no singing so as not to spread the water droplets that are uh, said to cause transmission, perhaps, of the coronavirus. So... Uh, singing, 1 o'clock on the 31st, to, that, that would be um, today when you're watching this, and then the next week would be inside on June 7th. So, for those of you who are watching at home who might be a little uh, stressed now, I've had, uh, as, as the letters have gone out announcing this, I've gotten one or two phone calls and said, are you going to stop recording and broadcasting this service on YouTube? No, we're not stopping that. Uh, so... If you're not comfortable coming out yet, that's perfectly fine. Lord willing, you will still find us here next week. So let me say one more thing, if you aren't confused already. So for Sunday, June 7th, next Sunday, we're going to try live streaming our live service here at 1030. We have had technical problems in the past. We've made some changes we're going to try that on June 7th so that you will be watching live as the events unfold here in our sanctuary. If that doesn't work, we will reconsider recording again in advance, but we'll appreciate your feedback at that point. So, having said all of that, and uh, we'll, eventually we're going to be looking at transitioning our Wednesday night Bible study back to live and in person, but that won't be for weeks yet. Uh, so if you're interested in joining the Zoom Bible study, please let, give me your email address and we can include you in that. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That theme about who can stand in the presence of the Lord, that's going to surface again in our text in just a few minutes from the book of Isaiah. And we're grateful that he has invited us to come into his presence today. What honors him is when we confess to him that what he says to us is true when we agree with him. And one of the ways that we can do that is through the Heidelberg Catechism, which, which takes systematically a survey of all of the Scripture and pulls it together to reveal the core doctrines. So the Heidelberg Catechism for Lord's Day 22 
it is still going through the final phrases of the Apostles' Creed, and it asks, how does the resurrection of the body comfort you? The answer, not only my soul will be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but even my very flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. And a second and final question for today, how does the article concerning life everlasting comfort you? Even as I am Already now, even as I already now experience in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, so after this life I will have perfect blessedness, such as no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no man has ever imagined, a blessedness in which to praise God eternally. Well, let me read to you from the book of Isaiah a single verse that serves today as our call to confess our sins. Listen to these gracious words from our Lord. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Take a few moments wherever you are and make confession to the Lord. And now let me offer a prayer of confession. Father in heaven, <clears throat> excuse me, we have sinned in that we fail to live in light of the coming resurrection. We fall short on showing proper gratitude for the gift of eternal life. We neglect preparation for the day we will see you face to face. Instead, we live as people whose great possession is life rooted in the things of this world. Forgive us for rebelling against your generous gifts and grant us grace to be willing to sacrifice what we have presently in order to be holy and useful in your kingdom so that we might share in the reward you have prepared for us. Increase our faith in your promises and increase our love for you so that we will long to be with you in glory. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Listen to a few verses from Psalm 103. Occasionally, when I see we have visitors in our sanctuary, I, I'm always careful to, oh, I try to be careful to let them know that I don't have any authority to um, forgive you in God's behalf. I can't absolve your sins. Only God can do that. But what I can do is I can share scripture with you that assures that God has heard. If you genuinely have repented, he has honored that. Psalm 103 verses 10 through 13 say this, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Amen. And let's pray the collect together. O oh God, please fill us with your Holy Spirit, so that our hearts will be knitted to Christ, our whole selves cleansed, our spirits revived, our souls filled with faith, and our bodies disciplined to do the will of our Father in heaven. We pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. And now let me read to you from the prophet Isaiah, the verses that will be the text for our sermon this morning. We're continuing on uh, in pretty much a verse-by-verse -verse study. So today we are up to Isaiah 33, verses 10 through 16. Isaiah 33, beginning with verse 10. Now I will rise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. You shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. And the people shall be like the burnings of lime. Like thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. Hear, you who are afar off, what I have done. And you who are near, acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. 
Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. And I'd like to read a New Testament lesson also from the book of Acts chapter 2. Today is Pentecost Sunday. So it's been 50 days already since we celebrated the resurrection of our Savior, 10 days since we remembered his ascension into heaven, and on Pentecost, what happened was Jesus dispatched the Holy Spirit. So let me read to you the account of that. Acts chapter 2, and I'm beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and sat, one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling <clears throat> excuse me, in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. <clears throat> excuse me. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, uh, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongue the wonderful works of God." So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, let me pray. Lord Jesus, we have heard your word. Now may you unfold it to us. Now may you give us understanding. And I, as your servant, I stand here uh, ready to present all that I believe you've been teaching me this week. Thank you for working in my heart. Please continue to work in my heart. But work in the hearts of all my brothers and sisters, too, who will be hearing. And may your word accomplish all that you desire. May you be honored and glorified by the preaching of your word. May your spirit move among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, we're looking at the Isaiah passage this morning that I read. Some people have fine dreams for the future, but when they actually face reality, things grow quite uncomfortable. You might have dreams of a happy family in a quaint house, but what of the reality of loving your spouse through periods of sickness and financial hardship and sins committed and seemingly irreconcilable opinions where you're at loggerheads all the time? The fairy tale picture seems different when you look at the details up close and hard work sets in. Or perhaps a young person wants to be a doctor 
And when you get to the whole matter of the long, arduous process of schooling and the massive debt that seems to be required and a health care system that seems to be sometimes hard on doctors, perhaps he or she will change his or her mind. Many children who fantasize about what they will do in life, they experience course corrections when they mature to have realistic senses of their own aptitudes. Oh, maybe young boys think about going off to war and it seems glorious, but what about the nightmares of those who return? Or maybe some child dreams of being an ice skater or a star musician, but you realize you have to give up your childhood if you really want to do that, and there's a cost associated, and that, count, that cost has to be counted. I listened to a lecture recently of a, a young man who, he, when he was in college, he had all these dreams. He was going to work in inner city neighborhoods. He was going to be a teacher. He was going to start a nonprofit organization. All of these were very good and noble goals. And he involved himself in so many things. It was actually more than he could handle. And he didn't realize that until he started his student teaching. And he had all this responsibility that he had created for himself, and the kids in the inner city didn't care about his noble goals, and so they didn't respect him, and they didn't cooperate with his whole plan of all the great things he was going to do. And one morning he woke up with half of his face paralyzed. He had Bell's palsy. And even after that began to write itself, he actually couldn't form sentences and speak. Needless to say, he needed a course correction in life. He was trying to do a bit too much, and he testified that in God's providence, that was all for the good. So what about our faith? Are you grounded in reality regarding your Christianity, regarding your understanding of salvation? You want a Savior who, a savior who rescues you from eternal punishment and opens heaven for you who gives you joy here on this earth and helps you in your problems. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, of course not. And that's who the Bible presents Jesus to be. But have you considered the reality of the life that you must live day by day as a Christian? Have you considered what is expected of you? Have you noted your inability to live up to what a Christian should be or should do? Do you realistically expect that you can be a Christian in practice? Have you counted the cost of following Christ? No, I'm not saying that salvation is earned. The Bible is quite plain about that. There's nothing we do that obligates God to show favor to us or let us into heaven. Even though every sin that we commit merits an eternal punishment because we are sinning against an infinitely a majestic, a majestic and glorious God, he is gracious, which means he gives gifts. And he gives those gifts, the gifts of salvation, to undeserving sinners like you and like me. Think about the people of Judah in the 8th century BC. We've been reviewing what was going on in their country. This is Isaiah's day. These people tried every possible solution except trusting in God when they were faced with a national crisis of an invasion <clears throat> excuse me, by the Assyrian army. They did not want to turn to God because they did not want to acknowledge his majesty and have to give up their sins and rearrange their lives to exalt him. So they turned to Egypt, which is exactly what he had told them not to do. Then, maybe you don't recall this, but we, we covered this a few years ago in our study of First and Second Kings. Get ready for this one. You know how they showed that they did not love and trust God? Do you know how they declared that he was basically worthless to them and defied his offer for help? King Hezekiah took all the money out of the temple treasury and he had workmen strip all the gold off of the doors of the sanctuary. And he took all that wealth that belonged to God, belonged to the temple, and he sent it to his enemy, Sennacherib, the leader of the Assyrian invasion force, trying to broker a deal. You know what that said? It said, we don't love God. We don't think God can satisfy us. 
And so we'll dismantle the temple where we worship him. We have to take care of ourselves. Forget all that worship and that useless stuff. We have a crisis, and so we've got to deal with it. That would be like saying, I am really in trouble, so I'm going to stop giving money to God. And that shows the state of your faith because you're willing to take what belongs to God and give it to someone else because you think that that someone else is who can really help you. Now, if you were God and that was done to you, would you be jumping up and down with eagerness and excitement to go help those people who were so disloyal to you? Those wicked, ungrateful people who turned their backs on the God, who had blessed their ancestors, who had given them a land, who had performed miracle after miracle for them, delivering them from trouble after trouble. He had bound himself to them in a covenant. If you were God... Would you be so eager to go help these people? Go find, go, think, of, think of, if you can use your imagination for a minute, think of, think of a person or some people that have very poor character. I guess if you don't know anybody personally, you can watch the news and find someone. And, and they make lots of mistakes. And if they had the chance, they would actually be violent against you. And they can't be trusted. Now go bind yourself to them and help them and give yourself to them. That sounds crazy. And yet that's what God does. And we saw last week when we studied the first nine verses of this chapter that the people only turned to God as the absolute last resort when they had nowhere else to turn. They prayed a very humble prayer, which we looked at last week, and they began to remember their heritage, and they began to value the covenant promises of God that they had suppressed and forgotten purposely. And what seems so surprising to us is that God was willing to help them. Salvation is by grace. He gave a free gift of his help to rebels, rebels who did not deserve it. But now that they're in trouble, they realize that they need to fear God. Verse 10, now I will rise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. Isn't that the type of God which makes us so happy? He will hear our prayers. After we have treated him wrongly, after we have despised his love, after we've acted like we know better than he does, When we're finally humbled, we find that he was waiting all the time with open arms to heal us of our stupidity and our self-inflicted troubles. He shows that he will be our defender after all, even after such gross disloyalty to him. That's like Jesus hanging on the cross, praying to his father and saying, Father, forgive these people who are murdering me because they don't know what they're doing. God exalts himself by saving his undeserving people like you and like me. Imagine if that quality of love infiltrated our lives and we loved each other with that same intensity. Verse 11, you shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. Now this is downright exciting because now God addresses the enemies of Judah the Assyrian army, which has pretty much gotten its own way for about 250 years. Nobody's been able to defeat them. That's a formidable force. (laughs) Long history. They know what they're doing as far as conquering nations. But God is bigger. How blessed we are to have God caring for us in times of the coronavirus or when we make a mess out of our lives or when death approaches our family or when financial hardship encroaches or when Satan tries to destroy us or when we face any kind of danger. Our God is bigger. This is a magnificent God and a magnificent salvation that we have. And here he's talking to the Assyrians who had come to annihilate his people. And he says, your efforts will come to nothing. Imagine if you grew a crop of wheat and the chaff is the little little husk around the fruit of the, the, the wheat. And imagine if as you walked through the wheat field, you saw how beautiful it looked 
And then when you went to harvest it, you found it was all chaff. There was nothing inside. It would be like, maybe for the rest of us, it would be like going to the grocery store and you're hungry for fresh fruit. So you, you see these oranges and these bananas that look really spectacular. If they taste as good as they look, you, you can't wait to get them home and peel them and, and eat them. So you get home and you peel yourself an orange and there's nothing on the inside. It was just a beautiful peel. And you peel your banana and there's nothing on the inside. How did it grow like that? Well, that's what Assyria would find with their conquest of Jerusalem and with Judah. Their expectations would come to absolutely nothing. Stubble is what is left after the harvest is reaped. Stubble's worth nothing except to be burned up. So in the end, the Assyrians would go to a great deal of work, and yet they would be too late to the harvest party. They would end up with nothing. And their own evil fury, this verse says, would bring down upon themselves complete destruction. Evil has a tendency over time to turn on itself, to implode. Evil regimes often end in hateful and maniacal schemes, working murder from within. This is all good news for God's people. Evil will be defeated. We will be protected. Verse 12, and the people shall be like the burnings of lime. Like thorns cut up, they shall be burned in the fire. Limestone can be burnt to a powder and then used in a plaster or mortar. And also back in that culture, if you wanted to show the, the utmost disrespect to your enemy, you burned his corpse until it was just a small pile of powder. So whatever the scenario that was in mind here, the picture is one of absolute and complete destruction for the enemies of God. They would so completely taste the wrath of God that there would be virtually nothing left. They would so completely taste the wrath of God that it would be irreversible. Another picture is added here where dry thorns are gathered up and burned. And what do you have left when they're burned? Nothing. Verse 13, hear you who are afar off what I have done, and you who are near acknowledge my might. This powerful act which God would do would be a testimony to the world that the God of Judah, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is the only true God that exists anywhere and that he saves his people. There is no one above him. So salvation is available only by making peace with this God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God who defeats the greatest superpowers known to man. I, I think the, the power of the Assyrian army was unprecedented up to that point. And the implication is that the gods of any other nation cannot stand up to our God. And those who are near him, this verse says, those of us who have grown up in the church and we know we're part of the covenant community, we know the stories of the saints in the Old Testament and we know his covenant promises and threats and we worship him, well, we should worship as never before when we realize who he really is and we see his power put on display. But what was this act of deliverance? What's he talking about? What's he going to do to rescue the city of Jerusalem from this massive invasion force that has surrounded it and laid siege to it? Well, he destroyed 185,000 Assyrian troops in one night. Now, maybe this talk about the burnings of lime, maybe that's just poetic figurative language, but I don't think so. I think that's giving a fairly accurate estimation, or an accurate accounting, rather, of how the angel of the Lord came and destroyed those 185,000 troops. Because, the reason I say that is because as we move on to verse 14 in just a minute, you're going to see that it left an impression on the residents of Jerusalem. And here's what I think happened. I think the angel of the Lord came along and he incinerated, if you will, he cremated 185,000 Assyrian troops alive. What terror must have overtaken them? Yeah, this is our God. He acts decisively to free us from our enemies and from our sins. And he brings judgment on Satan and death and sin and everything that would keep us out of heaven. 
What a reason we have to celebrate. And he does this for free. We can't earn it. He does it all for us. What a magnificent salvation we have. What a reason we have to celebrate. We didn't deserve it. And yet he chose to love us. What a God we serve. Won't heaven be wonderful when he is just lavishing his love on us? Look, if he has this kind of power and, and this kind of authority and he, we are the apple of his eye, look at the blessing that is ours to come. Verse 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Okay, so let's use our imaginations again. So let's say you, you, your family lives in Jerusalem and you go up before bed one night and you go up to the wall and you look out and as far as you can see in all directions is the Assyrian invasion force. And you hug your children you have no idea what's going to happen. You figure it's not good. Nobody can escape. It's like you stand there and together as a family, you look out and you look at death right in the face. And then you go to bed. And in the middle of the night, you hear a big ruckus outside the city walls. And you gather your children and your, your palms are sweaty. And, and maybe you have a sword or a spear or, or a hammer or something that you're, you're thinking, they, the, they must have breached the wall. This is it. I love you kids. And, and you think we're all going to die tonight and you're going to fight them off as long as you can to protect your wife and your children. And, and then after a while, the ruckus dies down and nobody ever comes into your house. And in the morning, all the men of the city are standing on the wall waiting for the first ray of sunlight to look out and see what on earth was all the ruckus last night. And you know what they see? 185,000 little piles of dust. Uh, that saved the people of Jerusalem from having to dispose of 185,000 corpses. Uh, now, what do you think would happen? Well, I think there'd be this massive celebration because when you went to bed the night before, you thought that you were going to die. Now you're going to live. You're going to live and the enemies are defeated. What a God you serve. Can you imagine that there would have been music and they, whatever food was left in the city, they would have brought it out to feast on. They would have opened the doors. People could come and go freely now. It's like the quarantine. Well, it was more than like the quarantine being lifted here in our state. Uh, how wonderful it would have been for us to be able to, to rejoice with brothers and sisters that day had we been there. But I'll bet that there was, I'll bet that there was at least a few very thoughtful people I picture somebody standing up there on the wall and they look out at the 185,000 little piles of dust. I, I, unless, like I said, maybe this is all just poetic, figurative language. I don't think so. They, they look out at the 185,000 little piles of dust and they, they look inside the city at all their fellow countrymen, the other citizens of Jerusalem, celebrating, dancing, and they, it dawns on them, you know what? The people inside the walls are just as flammable as the people outside the walls. Hmm. The God who saves us is not safe. He's not tame. We cannot take him for granted. He deserves respect and reverence. He will devour sin and whatever is attached to it. And the Assyrians were devoured because they were saturated. They were soaked in sin. What of the covenant people in Jerusalem who likewise were saturated with sin? They're called hypocrites. They were not seeking God to deliver them from their sin. They only wanted God to deliver them from the Assyrians. This miracle, I guess, was not going to make them obey. After the hypocrites saw what happened to the Assyrians, they became pretty nervous. They were confronted with the reality of God's wrath against sin and how he desires his people to live. 
And so they, somebody asks here, who can live with God? Who can live with these burnings? Our God is a consuming fire. They formerly, the hypocrites, formerly thought that God was this nice grandfatherly figure who handed out candy every chance he got. Now they come to find out he's holy and he expects his people to be holy. Elsewhere in the Bible, we read about God being a consuming fire and that hypocrites who are, who are inside the church will actually have a worse spot on the day of judgment than people who've never heard anything about the living and true God. Jesus taught that. There were cities in which Jesus taught where the people, they rejected him and he said, let me tell, now this is my klutzing paraphrase, he said, let me tell you something, folks. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah and the wrath that fell on them how they were destroyed, it'll actually be better on judgment day for them than it will be for you because you've met me and you've heard my teaching and you've seen my miracles and still you choose not to rearrange your life to follow me. So that means that being where we are, baptized members of the church in covenant with God, it can be either the most comforting position ever or the most unsettling position. It's comforting to know that God is for you, but hypocrites who only want to fantasize about a hunting cabin in heaven with grandpa and care nothing about serving the living and true God, bowing before him in reverence, devoting their whole selves to holiness, they'll actually have greater condemnation than people who never were a part of the church. Verse 15. So here's an answer to the question. We're going to break this down phrase by phrase before we finish here. This is an answer. What's the question? The question is, who among us can dwell with a devouring fire? <laughs> who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? In other words, who can be near a holy God? So here's the answers. Well, let's just take it phrase by phrase. He who walks righteously. That means you respect God's laws. Galatians 5 says that people who, as a lifestyle, practice adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and so on, will not inherit the kingdom of God, even if they profess to be Christian, even if they are a part of a church. To ignore God's law is to tell him, you know what, I can find something better than what you offer, and actually, I know better than you do. And if you want to come along and sprinkle some blessings in my life, why, please, come along and do that. God doesn't play that role very well. He, he doesn't bring pixie dust. He demands to be worshipped because of who he is, and rightly so. So if you like the idea of Jesus dying on the cross for your sins, but you have no interest in seeking his grace to actually remove those sins from you, that's the definition of a hypocrite, according to this passage, and that makes you a highly flammable substance trying to dwell with God who is a consuming fire. Next, it says in verse 15 that you must speak uprightly. That means that you need to pay attention to your words. You need to be reliable in what you promise. Don't renege on what you say you will do. Clean, you have to be clean in your language not given to deception, not using innuendos and gossip to ruin someone, not speaking cruelly or boasting about yourself, but being pure in your speech and giving thanks and building others up and encouraging them and promoting truth and extending the kindness of God and showing respect and reverence where it is due. Thirdly, the third qualification of what it takes to live in God's presence it says you have to despise the gain of oppressions. In other words, your chief desire is not to make money, to get rich, to have more than other people do. Your goal is to be like God. It's not wrong to turn a profit. It's not wrong to be well off financially, but it is wrong to have that as your life's goal because if that is your ultimate life's goal, then you will sacrifice ethics along the way in your search to increase your holdings. And you will gladly accept profit and you will purposely ignore whether or not anyone was taken advantage of in the process. A godly person would care about those in need and not make profit their first priority. A godly person would not cheat someone on wages or, or gamble away what God has given 
or use some technically legal loophole to defraud others. The fourth thing in this verse, uh, in answer to the question, who can live with the holy God? It says, you gesture with your hands, refusing bribes. This means you will not do unethical favors. Waving the hands shows that you have no cash that was pressed into them when somebody gave you a handshake. Uh, That means that you will not look the other way to hide your convictions or bend the rules. There's no good old boys network in the body of Christ. No special rules for corrupt friends. Number five, it says that you will stop your ears from hearing of bloodshed. In other words, you have no involvement in corruption of any kind. You will not listen to people plotting evil of any sort. You want nothing to do with vengeful, malicious talk that just tears other people down. You don't even joke about wanting to see evil happen to other people. You pray for them. And lastly, number six, and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Seeing evil has become great entertainment in our culture. You can watch any kind of crime or passionate violation of God's law on electronic media, or you can play games where you're actually the one doing those things on electronic media. And we all have indwelling sin clinging to us and living within us, and it likes to be tickled and scintillated by watching evil. And it says, well, I'm not actually doing it. I'm just watching. Well, how can you live in fellowship with God who is a consuming fire and enjoy watching evil at the same time? How can you combine those two in your own life? Why not learn to enjoy righteousness instead? Verse 16, he will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him, his water will be sure. Here's how I might summarize the life of a person who has learned to live in the presence of the holy God. He is already living in another world. He's separated from the garbage of this world, not in terms of ministering. He wants to minister to people, but in terms of playing the world's games and getting mired in their schemes. We may feel afraid to cut ourselves off from the type of beauty which belongs to this world, the world's entertainment, the world's materialism. How will we be satisfied without it? You can't imagine not doing without what the world has to offer. It would be like a kid who can't get off of his phone going to camp and not taking his phone. What a panic. How's he going to survive? And when he gets there, he finds out, oh, there is a whole world to explore. So, if we are willing to leave behind this world's version of beauty, we'd find out that there actually is something better. There's a greater beauty in God's continual provision and righteousness extended to you and the cleanness of His love that He shares with you. Is there anything more beautiful than the cross? What does the world have to offer that could even come close to that quality of beauty? We give up what is counterfeit to gain the real thing. Learning to live in the presence of the Holy God is like, according to this verse, is like being moved to a mountaintop fortress. But if you're in a mountaintop fortress, how are you going to grow your food? And how are you going to dig a well through the rock? Well, the answer is God supplies it. So people who do not take refuge in God and His promises act to take care of themselves. And they fail to believe that God can satisfy them. Go back to what I said at the beginning. Hezekiah stripped all the gold and the money out of the temple and sent it off to his enemy, Sennacherib. So he thought he had to to take care of himself. He didn't trust God to take care of him. People who have learned to live in God's presence are safe and secure from the fire of God's wrath. And they've learned that God supplies more than is needed. He gives himself to us. But how do we come to be the type of people who can live in God's presence? It seems to me that it would take a whole lot of trying on our part to make ourselves over. But then we'd be back to what I mentioned at the beginning. Salvation by works. And we know that that's not possible. 
Well, today is Pentecost Sunday, the day we remember that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to fill and empower the church to be his people and to carry out his work. It is the Holy Spirit who regenerates us, who makes us alive to God. He cleanses us. He applies to us the righteousness of Christ. He makes us acceptable to God. He gives us a taste for divine beauty. He engrafts us into Christ so that we begin to resemble his holiness. Without the Holy Spirit, we would have no way to connect to Jesus and to produce the benefits of our lives that Christ intended. We can both give thanks and continue asking for the Holy Spirit's working in us. Those of us who would live in God's presence and enjoy such wonderful salvation must face reality, the reality that we are dependent on the Holy Spirit to remove our hypocrisy. We are called to live by principles greater than seeking our own comfort and pleasure. Hypocrites live in a fantasy of imagined salvation. The truly godly realize the life to which we are called and the hardships of self-denial, and we seek the Spirit's help. Even though our house is not on the market yet, Nancy has begun some preliminary packing and I don't know how much she's actually gotten rid of, but there's a lot of talk that we're getting rid of stuff. Not everything that we accumulated over the years is going to make it into the next house. On Judgment Day, God is going to discard some things. Not everything that accumulated in the church over the centuries is going to be taken to the next house. It is the hypocrites that will be left behind. Those who wear his name but trample his honor... They dreamed of an easy salvation, but they didn't fear God. They proved themselves to be empty chaff, looking nice on the outside, but containing no useful fruit. And going back to Galatians 5, the fruit, I referred to Galatians 5 earlier, the fruit that God seeks in us is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. One of the authors I read this week asked the question, what can exist with God except what is like him. So it is the Holy Spirit in us who makes us like Christ. With each passing week, with each passing year, he is working to make us holy. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the great, wonderful salvation that is available to us for free. We could not earn it. And yet you have acted with such power to destroy our enemies. You have acted with such beautiful love to care for us when we were your enemies. Lord Jesus, thank you for this wonderful salvation that we, will, that we have inherited and we will enjoy heaven with you forever and ever and you, you promise that you will satisfy us. You're the God who, if I understand all this correctly, you incinerated 185,000 of these people who were going to wipe out your people. Lord, you love us and you will stop at absolutely nothing to save us. So now we ask that you pour your spirit upon us and rid us of all hypocrisy. Lord, we don't want to be pretending to be believers. We don't want to be believers in name only. Who can dwell with these continual burnings who can live near the God who is a consuming fire? Lord, please help us to walk righteously and teach us to love your law and guard our lips so that we would speak uprightly, so that what comes out of our lips would be true and that we would honor our commitments and our promises and that we would not be tearing others down and using foul words. And Lord, May we speak truth filled with your love. Rid us of a desire for financial gain where we'd be willing to bend the rules. Instead, teach us to be generous rather than always wanting more at any cost. Take far from our hearts anything that resembles a bribe or unethical favors. Prevent us from being engaged in hateful conversations about ruining people and delighting in others' demises. Turn our eyes from evil toward your beauty. Make us holy as you are holy. Produce in us the fruit that is pleasing to you, the fruit of love and joy, peace, 
long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Lord, thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would watch over us through this pandemic. You have been so kind to watch over us all these weeks. Please continue to bless our church family with safety. And as we begin meeting, may we transmit nothing to each other other than the love of Christ and the truth of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would send us more brothers and sisters in the months ahead who would be willing to join in the work and the worship that we hope to engage in. Increase our witness so that others would come to know Christ through us. Open our lips to be able to proclaim truth to others. May we do so as servants, but may we do so boldly because we are confident that you have called us to be your people. Father, I, recording these serv- services in advance, I wasn't thinking about it being Memorial Day last weekend, so I'd like to give you thanks for those who died to procure freedom in this country. Thank you for those who were willing to give of themselves for a cause greater than themselves. So may we be in your kingdom. And Lord, thinking of the freedom that we have here in this country, may we not squander it, but may we use it to please you. Lord, may you bless our preparations for Vacation Bible School. And I pray that children would come to know Christ as Savior. And again, may there be no transmission of any kind of virus. Father, we give you thanks for the beauty of this season as we see things growing. I know there's places in our country where there's drought and the crops are doing very poorly, and there's other places in this country where there's flooding and the crops are doing very poorly, but you've blessed us. So, Lord, we want to acknowledge your kind providences to us. Again, fill us with your spirit. Help us to grow in our love for each other and for you. Help us to be holy as you are holy. Again, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us when we were so unlovely and we were such rebels. Continue to love us. Continue to intercede for us. Continue to sanctify us and make us like you are. We pray all this in your name, Lord Jesus, and we also offer the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, um, again, normally we would have our offering and sing the doxology as a response. And uh, we've appreciated those of you who have been um, tuning in via YouTube Uh, We've appreciated the uh, contributions that have continued to come, and I would ask you to continue to remember that if you're remaining at home. Uh, But let's, um, let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We have reason to celebrate that God has sent us His Holy Spirit. If you're not familiar with the hymn, The Comforter Has Come, You can Google it. You can look it up. That's what Nancy will be playing in just a moment. And now receive your Lord's benediction from Romans 15. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.